Hello everyone, this is Dr. Nidhi from Biotechnica. I welcome you to another session and in the following session we'll discuss about the questions those were asked from Unit 10 Ecological Principles in the recent CSIR exam paper held on 17 September 2022, Shift 1. So 10 questions were there from this particular unit. Now let us find out that what was the level of the questions and let's have a discussion over the explanations to these questions. Let us get started. So the first question with question ID number 32. This question is simple, right? And this is about the forest type which occupies the largest area in India, right? So four options they have been given tropical rainforest, tropical dry deciduous forest, temperate deciduous forest, and temperate evergreen forest. Now, this question has been asked from the subunit biogeography. Okay, this is based on the biomes. So, as we know that basically we can divide the forest into three types, tropical, temperate, and boreal forest. Okay, further tropical, uh, we'll have tropical rainforest and tropical deciduous forest. Likewise, you'll have temperate rainforest and temperate deciduous forest. Okay. Now, here, the option, the right option should be option two, that is tropical dry deciduous forest. So, let me tell you that, in fact, tropical deciduous, these are uh, known as monsoon forest also. They found in the large part of India, then in northern Australia and in Central America as well. Now, if we talk about the India only, then tropical deciduous forest, these are the most widespread, the widespread forest of India. Okay, they are known as monsoon forest and they spread over the region receiving rainfall between 200 centimeter and 70 centimeter. Okay, now tropical deciduous forests, they actually shed their leaves uh, for around six to eight weeks during the summer season, the dry season, uh, of course, to conserve water. And we can further divide uh, these tropical deciduous forests into tropical wet forest and tropical dry deciduous forest, depending upon uh, the availability of water. Okay, so like tropical uh, wet forest, they are found in those areas uh, which have the rainfall in between 200 to 100 centimeters. Okay, and tropical dry deciduous forest, so those fall in those areas where the rainfall range remains 100 to 70 centimeters. Okay, so tropical deciduous forest, undoubtedly, they cover the maximum uh, fraction among the other types of forest if we talk about India, right? So, now let us move to our next slide and let us have a look at the next question with question ID. 33. Okay, so now this question asks that which one of the following biome is known to occur in India? Now you have been provided with four options here tundra, tundra boreal forest, taiga, and alpine grassland. Here, as per the CSIR key, option four that has been given as the right answer, but this question could be challenged. Yes, this question could be challenged because all these types of biomes they have been found to be occurring in India. So the question is not very much clear, right, that whether this is asking about the biome which is present in uh, most abundance, okay. So we, this question can definitely be challenged as all the biomes given in options, they are known to occur in India and uh, hence we can challenge CSIR key uh, for the clarity over the question or about the answer about the right option given. Now let us move to our next question with question ID number 36. Here the question asks that which of the following is typically true of invasive species. Now this is a very interesting question and at the same time this is quite an easy question to have. Okay now options given are they are R selected, K selected or they are habitat specialists. They are always introduced by humans. Now to answer this question first of all you must know that what do we understand by invasive species right. So invasive species that is the name given to the species which are not native to a particular ecosystem. They are not indigenous to a particular ecosystem. Now these kind of species means the invasive belonging to any invasive means 
those which are being considered as an invasive species to a habitat to an ecosystem they can harm the health of the humans animals or plants living in that particular ecosystem which is under consideration okay so they can cause environmental and economical harms to the area how because they will not have the predators okay if we, we talk about the animals so they will invasive animal species so they will not have the predators okay in the ecosystem where uh, they will be invading and then the native species they will not have developed with the defensive adaptations against these species and that is where the invasive species they could out compete over these native species uh, to get the resources to get the light to get the space even they can disturb the habitat okay or they can just disturb the food webs existing in the ecosystem moreover like i've told you that the native species they have not developed the defensive adaptations against the invasive species so they may kill the native species as well they may uh, just interfere with the reproduction of the native species so that is where they are harmful to the native species for sure okay now they can even bring some kind of disease along with them okay now to uh, to make themselves dominant in the area where they are invading definitely they have to reproduce very quickly okay uh, so therein they have to show a very quick growth very rapid growth or maturation okay so that is where they are expected to be r selected now this is another thing which you should know r selected and k selected strategies so whenever i teach this concept i always tell my students that this is very important to understand that basically we can keep the living species into two categories based on how natural selection has worked r selected and k selected now r selected is the name given to those species right which reproduce very quickly means they do have tremendous reproductive potential they invest only in reproduction although the offsprings uh, all of all of the offsprings reproduce they might not be able to survive right majority of them they will not be able to survive okay but yes they will be showing rapid growth and quick maturation right early maturation so because of that reason we can definitely expect the invasive species be r selected okay yes so like i had explained that they must show a rapid life cycle so that is where they are expected to be r selected now let us move to our next question with question id number 37 okay now this is a graph based question and here it has been asked that which of the following correctly represents the relationship between the rate of population growth and population size so definitely this question has been taken from population ecology and it is based on population growth models okay so as we know that one topic to be focused from ecology is population ecology and these two population growth models of course which are exponential and logistic now this question is based on the logistic population growth model okay let us find out that what is the right option first so right option is option two okay this one right now let us discuss that why it would be the right option okay so we had to tell that which of the graph is representing the correct relationship between the rate of population growth that is dn by dt and population size that is n so logistic population growth model that task uh, that ask uh, you know that tells about the carrying capacity it, it considers the carrying capacity okay which is represented by k and here as per the logistic model remember the population growth that will increase okay that will increase and then it will become maximum when the population will be half of the carrying capacity i'm sure you all know what is carrying capacity carrying capacity is the maximum number of individuals those could be supported by any habitat okay so when the number of individuals will become equal to half of the carrying capacity the population growth that will be maximum okay and after that it will decrease and when n will become equal to k the population growth that will become equal to 
zero. So therein you will get this parabola shaped curve. So yes, definitely I, the graph given in option two, that is the right answer. Okay. All right. Now let us move to our next question with question ID number 103. Now here the question asks, you know some statements that have been given and this question is related to biodiversity okay so following are a few statements about india's biodiversity okay so four statements have have been given and we have to choose the combination for the correct statement so let us find out that what is the right answer yes option four that means statement c and d they are correct Okay, now let's find out that why they are correct and why the other two options, option A, statements A and B, they are incorrect. So in the statement A, we have been given India has 2.4% of the world's land area, which is absolutely true. But next, it has been mentioned that it accounts for 12% of all recorded spaces, which is not true, right? Because 8.1% uh, of the total species that have been recorded so far. So therefore, statement 1 is incorrect. Now, statement 2, it has been given that 45,000 species of animals and 91,000 species of plants, they are there in India. However, let me tell you that 45,000 species of plants and twice as many animals, they have been recorded from India. Hence, statement 2 is also incorrect. Now, if we look at the statement 3, right, which is about the biodiversity hotspot. So, let me tell you that what do we understand from biodiversity hotspot uh, for most? Biodiversity hotspot is a term uh, which is used for that biogeographical region which is under the threat of the habitat degeneration or habitat degradation. Okay, uh, like many endemic species, they could be present in that particular area which have to be saved because these are endemic species they might not be present anywhere else okay so if we take measures to conserve those species there so that would be having an enormous impact over saving our global um, biodiversity okay now here four of the globally identified biodiversity hotspots can be found in india this is true right because Yes, we can see that four out of the 36 hotspots present in the world means out of the 36 hotspots in the world, four they are present in India, Himalayas, Western Ghats, the Indo-Burma region and from the land. Okay, next statement is India is estimated to harbor around 60% of the global tiger population. So that is again true. So this is the reason that option four, which is having statement c and d in combination that is correct now let us move to our next question with question id number 107 it, this is again a graph based question as expected in ecology we can definitely expect the questions to be graph based mainly right now here the graph below the graph which is given below it depicts trajectories right so here we can see four trajectories, A to D, they have been provided. Okay. Some of the major drivers of global environmental change that are mentioned alongside. Okay. Match the trajectories with the correct drivers. Right. So we have to find out uh, that, you know, the descriptions which have been given here. So how we can match to their respective trajectories. Here, uh, now if you will look at the graph carefully, now how we can reach at the right answer, right? So, we have land area being given here. So, definitely we can expect that land area will not change significantly, okay? So, we can expect it to remain constant or at least if we expect that it is uh, changing, so it will not increase, it will decrease, Why? Right? Because glaciers, they are melting, right? Because of the global warming and all. And because of that, we can expect that land area may, got, may get decreased, right? But not increase, of course. And among all these trajectories given, you will find that only one, that is D, right? That we can consider for land area because 
this trajectory is showing that the land area means whatever parameter we will consider that would remain almost constant okay so now look at the options where do you have d as first matched with first so in option one and in option four right but then we have to cross check with the other options as well and therein if we can see this trajectory right where we could see a significant a drastic change that has been shown okay so this would be for the fertilizer use because we know post green revolution revolution that uh, happened in 1960 so it's you know excessive use of the fertilizer that has been done okay it's extensive use of the fertilizer that is being done uh, for agriculture so here we can match trajectory a with the fertilizer okay so that is where we are reaching uh, the option one as our correct answer okay and after that we have two more uh, parameters given here that is carbon dioxide concentration and human population okay so if you will match them with the trajectories so you know you will see that atmospheric co2 concentration uh, so that could be matched with trajectory c why it is so because yes co2 concentration that is increasing okay but then that increase could not be as significant as it has been shown in trajectory b okay so b that should be for human population and c that should be for carbon dioxide concentration and that is where our option one that should be the right answer okay so like we had discussed land area that would be expected to remain almost constant and that is why we have chosen trajectory d there increase in co2 concentration is one of the major reason for global warming okay and it is increasing after 1955 but the change is small right so looking at the pattern of the trajectory we can match c with second human population has been increasing but then the relative proportional change was not that low like 0 0.5 which has been shown in one of the trajectories so you know keeping all these things in mind we can choose option one as the right answer all right uh, now let us move to our next question right this is question id 108 and that was a very tricky question okay so i won't say that that was an easy one okay and uh, now let us see what do we have in this question first then we'll discuss further here a diagram has been given okay a diagram has been given and some distributional curves they have been shown again a to d right in the order a to d of allochthonous organic matter and autochthonous matter now first of all you must understand that what do we mean by these terms okay allochthonous and autochthonous so allochthonous that is the name given to the deposit right like deposits of organic matter or anything which are being are deposited at a place away from their original source okay whereas autochthonous that will be the deposits at the same place so keeping these two terms in mind we have to find out that what pattern they what pattern they will be followed if we are moving from a small stream of water to the large rivers Right. So I hope you understood allochthonous that is for the deposits those originated at a distance from its present position. Right. Now let us find out that what should be the right answer here. So here the answer is option one. Okay. So now let us discuss that why it would be so. See when a small stream right, like in the diagram it has been given this is about the small stream which is transforming into the larger river okay means as we'll be moving from a small stream towards the larger water body so when a small stream running through a wooded catchment derives most of its energy input from the little litter that is being shed by the surrounded vegetation so what happens see when we have a small stream right so there will be plants around it okay and because of that the autotrophs which are there in the water body so they will not get 
the opportunity to, to produce the organic matter. And that is where we will see that most of the deposits, they will be along the roots. Right? So that what we have here, a small stream running through a wooded catchment that derives most of its energy input from the litter that is being shed by the surrounding vegetation. Why? Because shading from the trees that prevent any significant growth of planktonic or attached algae or aquatic higher plants. So it, it is only when uh, it will be you know uh, moving to towards the larger rivers that we'll find that the growth of the planktons would be there because the shady plants which are there surrounding the water body they will uh, be moving like very far because they'll be at the edges and now the water body is getting wider okay so because of that reason you could see uh, in the uh, curve b right in the curve b which has been matched with second right now what do we have in second autochthonous from phytoplankton so the same explanation will go here as well so as we are moving from the smaller stream towards the larger river remember the phytoplankton they will get a chance to grow okay so that is where you could see the shape of the curve like this okay and a is for one right a is for allochthonous so here as we had learned that the algae the phytoplanktons or the plants in the small stream they will not get a chance to uh, deposit the organic matter so whatever it will be getting it will be getting from the other sources right so that is where the option one that would be the right answer okay so likewise uh, if i explain further for c right c has been matched with Four, autochthonous from aquatic macrophytes. So here you can see that no, as this will be moving uh, from smaller stream to the larger rivers. So the green plants and all those would be there in the water body. They will get the chance to grow. However, when it will be become even larger, then the planktons, they will dominate even over the aquatic plants, other aquatic, other larger aquatic plants. Okay. So that was a difficult one, right? That was not a, a very easy question to be answered, okay? So I hope you were able to solve this question or if not, then I hope that you understood that what should be the explanation to this graph. Now let us move further and let us look at another question with ocean ID 110, okay? Now this is again a figure-based question, right? And and here three graphs they have been provided the graphs a to c they they are given below and they depict the seasonal variation in plankton biomass okay this is again regarding the plankton so this time we found that a lot of questions they were asked from the last three subunits from ecology okay biogeography and uh, applied biology conservation biology so from here a lot of questions they have been asked okay so uh, what do we have here in the question that we have been provided with three oceanic regions tropical oceans polar oceans temperate oceans right and then we have to match the pattern of the phytoplanktons or zooplanktons to the type of the oceans we have been given we have been provided in the question right so again you have to match the graphs to their respective type of oceans given Okay, so what should be the answer here? Answer is again option one, A that has been matched with one that is tropical oceans. Then we have B with two that is polar oceans and C with three that is temperate oceans. Okay, now how we can explain this? See, tropical oceans, that is the name given to the oceans. Uh, those are present between uh, the Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn. Now, right now, they get or they obtain almost the same amount of sunlight throughout the year, a constant uh, amount of sunlight, right? And because of that, you will find that they lack with the pronounced seasons, okay? So, as such, they do not have the discrete differentiated seasons, right? And thus, no pronounced seasonal cycle of plankton abundance and production would be seen 
all right so uh, central portion of pacific atlantic and most of the indian ocean so they are considered as a tropical ocean so no pronounced season as such and thus no pronounced seasonal cycle of the phytoplankton abundance okay and because of that we'll be choosing this graph for tropical ocean as you could see that there is no like bloom or the planktons they are falling abruptly we don't have that kind of thing in figure one okay now moving further uh, to have an explanation for polar ocean so polar oceans they have one phytoplankton bloom why because of the short growth season darkness in the polar winter and that what do we have in figure 2 so as you could see that there is one blue right in phytoplankton growth and that is where this could be matched with polar oceans like arctic oceans right then moving further to our uh, figure c right so here this is about temperate atlantic ocean why because it has presence of a spring and fall and because of that phytoplankton bloom that could be seen which will be further followed by an abundance maximum of zooplankton okay so i hope you know that what do we mean by plankton right plankton these are weak swimmers and then we can categorize then into phytoplankton and zooplankton so phytoplankton these are autotrophic of course like where you can have diatoms or uh, green algae okay and then zooplanktons they this uh, zooplankton they consist of the larval forms okay that means those are heterotrophic so zooplanktons they'll be feeding upon the phytoplankton so that is where we can see in the temperate oceans which actually have a mixture of cold polar oceanic water and the warm uh, typical water okay so what happens here spring and fall means we will be having discrete season and because of that phytoplankton bloom that could be seen and this will be followed by the abundance maximum of zooplankton and because of that reason yes uh, option 1 that would be the right answer okay now let us move to our next question question id 111 now here the question uh, asks that which one of the following statements given is not correct yes is not correct so we have to choose that which statement is not correct okay now if we look at the statement 1 niche bread tends to increase with interspecific competition while intraspecific competition tends to decrease it so there only we'll get the right answer okay niche bread that tends to increase with interspecific competition while intraspecific tends to decrease it so that is incorrect right remember intraspecific competition means the competition between the members of the same species that will tend to uh that will tend to increase the niche bread why because the members they are competing with each other okay so therein they will start looking for the alternative resources so even they will start utilizing the suboptimal resources if there is a possibility to obtain them means if there are some resources which they were not using earlier but to decrease the competition they will start using it and hence we can expand the niche bread to get expanded okay so remember the intra specific competition it will drive the niche bread expansion and that is where statement 1 is not correct okay so yes that was the right answer given okay so i think that was an easy one so if you know about the niche concept if you know about the niche bread then all uh, niche compression that concept so you could have easily answered this question right so here the explanation goes like this option 1 is incorrect as inter specific competition is believed to drive niche expansion because otherwise sub optimal resources can provide a refuge from competition means they can at least provide a relief to the members of the same species from the competition they might be facing now let us move to our next question with question id 150 okay now here a table has been given right with names of the organisms in one column and the adaptive characteristic in the other column so we were asked to select the correct option that matches with the name of the organism with the correct 
adaptation now that was an easy question if you know about the adaptations right now actually what happens that uh, let us have a look at the explanation so here uh, we know that animals they show a variety of defensive adaptation against their potential predators or to cope up with drastic environmental conditions okay like one type of adaptation is bed see and mimicry now this, this is really important right like in every exam we get to see one or the other question asked from the mimicry concept okay like we have Bettsian mimicry and then we have another Mullerian mimicry okay so under Bettsian mimicry what happens that a palatable or harmless species mimics an unpalatable or harmful model right why of course so that it could get protection from its potential predators Right. They might think this piece is to be harmful as well as it is mimicking the harmful model. Okay, so the one to whom it mimics that is known as model. Okay, the one who is mimicking that is known as mimic. And then we'll have a third participant who will be the potential predator. Okay, so coral snakes they are used as models by many snake mimics. Okay, coral snakes they are poisonous. And scarlet king snakes, they are not poisonous. So they are Betsian mimics. Harmless creatures that mimic the appearance of coral snakes in the hopes that they'll be mistaken for them by the predators and they could escape the predators. Right? So that is where we can match coral snakes with the mimic. Next, bioluminescence of the jellyfish aquaria. That is due to the presence of both green fluorescent protein. GSP and a chemiluminescent protein called Ecoli. Okay, so that is where we can match jellyfish with bioluminescence. Next, we have African lungfishes. Okay, so let us learn that what type of adaptation lungfishes they may show. Now they can undergo estivation. Okay, estivation is summer sleep, right? During desiccation, right? They may enter a state of corporal torpor. And cor torpor is where there will be decreased physiological activity. Okay. So they can uh, enter into estivation and they can live without food and water for up to five years. Yes. So lung fishes. So we can match uh, them with estivation. Right. So here we have estivation in the column given. Next we have aposematism. Now, what is aposematism? Here, the animals who produce effective chemical defenses, right? So, they may exhibit bright warning coloration, right? To warn their predators that they are harmful. They are not worth eating. They are not even worth coming closer, okay? So, here, smelly, stinging or bad tasting organisms, they usually have some means of warning potential predators to leave them alone. Okay, and monarch butterfly, it has a distinctive orange and black pattern as you could see here in the picture. Okay, to warn predators of the toxins that are stored in its body. So, keeping all these facts in mind, if you will look at the columns given in the question, you will find that answer one the option one is the right answer so you can match coral snakes with the mimicry okay you can match crystal jelly with the bioluminescence you can match lungfish with estivation and you can match monarch butterflies with apocytes so that was an easy one right so uh, there we have discussed all the questions those were asked from unit two unit ten yeah so let me know uh, that uh, how did you find the explanation and if you have any doubt over any of these questions do let us know in the comment section if you have any doubt over any of the questions which we have discussed in today's video thank you everyone for watching the video